Hello everyone, I'm Wendell Jones and welcome to this edition of our program, Jones and Company. On this program, we examine the national issues of the Bahamas and everywhere you go, people are talking about the increase in value-added tax and the economy of the Bahamas. Of course, the government of the Bahamas is, is making every effort to improve the fiscal situation of our country. And uh, Bahamians are in agreement with that, but uh, they have a difficulty with the increase in value added tax, some of them at least. And so on our program today, we're going to talk about the economy of the Bahamas and our fiscal situation with the new financial secretary of the Bahamas. We say new because he has been in office for just about a year or so. Uh, Mr. Marlon Johnson. Mr. Johnson has been making the news uh, since the last budget uh, was introduced in the House of Assembly, and so he has decided that he would grace us with his presence. And it's a delight to have him here today. Marlon Johnson, welcome to the program. It's good to be here, Wendell. Thank you. Uh, Godfrey Ineas, good to see you. Mr. Johnson reminded us that he was here 15 years ago. 15 years ago. Yeah. Made my, made my maiden voyage was around 15 years ago. Is that right? That's correct, yeah. Well, you, you still look pretty much the same. <laughs> right, right, right. So like guys keep it young too. So uh, life, okay. life has been good to you. Absolutely. You enjoying your position as financial secretary? Well, I wouldn't know if enjoy would be the right word, but I, um, it's, it's a challenge and, it's, and I, I enjoy a challenge. So, okay. uh, yeah, it's, it's been going. It's uh, been 10 months now. So, you're right, it's coming up on a year and mm -hmm. the time has flown and a lot has happened. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but, yeah, I'm enjoying the challenge and... and hoping to make a mark. You've been uh, receiving some flack, I, I see, uh, from reading the newspapers. Right. Eh? Yeah, well, you know, flack comes with the territory. I'm not, I don't shy down from that, and I understand the nature of the critique. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and hopefully, I'm able to explain what I'm doing and, and why I'm doing it, yeah. um, to the satisfaction, at least, of the payments. And this is the second time you've been working with the Ministry of Finance, as I understand it. That is correct. I started, actually, my professional career after college with the Ministry of Finance in 1991 as a budget analyst. As a junior finance officer was the title at the time. Okay. But I worked for the Ministry of Finance in the budget area for about 10 years mm -hmm. before I left to do other things. Right, right. Mr. Johnson, um, what it takes a lot to, I guess, produce a national budget, uh, and you've been a part of the process, I'm sure. Yes, that's correct. Uh, what is the government at the end of the day with this particular budget, 2018, 2019? What are you seeking to achieve in essence? Well, I think the government is seeking to do two things, really. One is the sort of this is its first budget as an administration because obviously. The budget that it brought to the House last time was a budget that was prepared in the main mm -hmm. by the previous administration. Of course, it's just an election timing issue. So this would be their first budget. So it is both for the new government a, a fiscal statement as well as an economic statement to sort of give a glimpse as to what their economic priorities are as well as what their fiscal and financial priorities are. So that's really, I think, this is sort of the signature budget for a new administration because this is the first one that reflects their um, particular mandate and their particular strategies and priorities. And the central feature of this uh, budget is really to reduce the deficit, isn't it? It is really to restore fiscal order. And that's a little bit more than re reducing the deficit because it also has significant expenditure adjustments upward. So fiscal order is more than just sort of reducing the deficit. It, it is making sure that um, all of your key priorities are funded properly, all of your bills are taken care of, and that you're setting the economy, uh, setting the country, not only in good financial footing, but also sound economic footing as well. Um, and there are some people who would suggest that the country was on strong economic footing. Right. And what this budget does is uh, it, it is creating a contraction in the economy. Well, I think that is one of the points of view that was brought across. Uh, my counter to that is very, very simple. I ask people, and when I've been encountered with that argument, I ask them to go back and take a look at what happened when the VAT was introduced the first time in the Bahamas. Back in 2015, when there was a lot of prognosis about doom and gloom and, and that it was going to create an economic contraction, something very interesting happened. In the year 2015, we saw the, economic improve, and the economy improve year on year by 1.1%. And even with the introduction of a 7.5% worth of, of tax, the economy actually grew better than it did the previous year. And even household consumption, in real terms, in adjusted for inflation, actually still went up a little bit. So I would tell one of the guiding light, and that, of course, that was then and this is now, but I think it signals to the fact that 
an increase in tax doesn't necessarily have to mean an economic contraction. Okay. Godfrey? Mr. Johnson, small countries like ours seem to be uh, draw the attention right. of international agencies, right. particularly the International Monetary Fund right. and also rating agencies. What role mm -hmm. did they play mm -hmm. in crafting the budget? That's a very good question. I'm glad you asked that. And the answer is none, none at all. None at all? None at all. One of the myths that had been from I was a young budget officer and coming in because I came in from college and in college you, know, you have all these radical fringes who talk about the World Bank and the IMF and how they control everything. So coming into the ministry back in 1991, you really didn't know what to expect. You thought um, that these agencies certainly were in, in, in the middle of crafting it. And I can say, I, I realized then, and I can say with certainty now sitting as the financial secretary, that they give zero input into the budget. They do have an impact, and that is certain, but not in any direct way. What governments do in the case of the IMF, all governments who are not a part of their program pay very careful attention to their Article 4 consultations yeah, yeah. because they, they come and they give their view on what the economy is and what governments are doing. So all governments around the world pay attention to that. Uh, the, the credit rating agencies have an even more profound impact because, of course, um, even though, again, they don't give direct input, governments have to be mindful of what their credit ratings will be because that impact your borrowing costs, which impact your interest payouts and the like. But I'm happy to dispel the notion, and I can say that sitting in the central seat, that they give no input um, into the budget. We didn't ask for any input from them, and they didn't offer any. But, but the government is very conscious of what particularly the rating agencies have to say. Though. Yeah, no, I think all governments have to be, but, but, but for a very good reason, because if the, the government finds itself in getting the credit downgrade, it has a very real impact, not only on the government, but all of us, mm -hmm. because as the credit rating, as your credit rating deteriorates, your borrowing, your, your, your borrowing costs go up. Yeah. So all citizens actually um, feel the pinch uh, when, when there's a credit downgrade. So they, much more so than any IMF or IDB or the like, um, they, they, are, they have some impact because governments want to keep a high credit rating. Um, you know, we hear that, Mr. Uh, Johnson, but when we hear the politicians mm -hmm. speak, right. Uh, in the family islands, right. the prime minister in particular, right. uh, we, we heard him talking about, um, he does, doesn't want to get a call in the middle of the night from right. the IMF. Right. Or right. He, so, so obviously, uh, pressure has been brought to bear on the government, apparently, right. Right. from these international agencies right. to do what you're doing. Well, actually, no, I don't know if that's necessarily how it's framed. I think what the PM's comment was, was sort of reflecting down the road. One of the things that the both he and the Deputy Prime Minister in, in framing the debate was to look at, at all good, and as same thing, previous administration, is to keep an eye out for the medium term. You know, there's obviously the, the, the clear necessity to be able to address your current needs, mm -hmm. but all administrations, from I came in, it was under um, the leadership of then um, Paul Adley as the, the Minister of Finance and Sir Lyndon as, as the Prime Minister. Um, they, they always had us focus on, well, okay, what are the implications of our decisions down the road? Uh, uh, Prime Minister Hubert Ng would be the same thing, Prime Minister Perry Christie. So I think the context of the current Prime Minister's discussion is to say what his concern is, is that at some point down the road, we don't end up in that kind of situation where he has to feel the call in the middle of the night from a, um, an IMF and the like. And I think that is how I interpreted his his particular conversation and what he was talking about. Have we been fiscally irresponsible um, in this country, um, Mr. Johnson? Because there's a school of thought that we have grown our economy very nicely. Right. Uh, we, have, we are developing our country very nicely, mm -hmm. order, orderly development. Right. Um, we have a very healthy uh, a reserve. Right. Um, uh, the government has not defaulted on, never defaulted on right. a loan. It right. pays its civil servant. Right. Um, but the Bahamian public is not getting that impression. Right. So, um, so haven't we been conservative mm -hmm. and fiscally responsible as a country? So you, the way that I would answer that is you have to look at it over the full arc. So two, two key, key things come to mind. Certainly, if you go back to independence to now, one of the features of we've always done, we've always run deficits, but we've, they've always been manageable. 
they've always been relatively small as a percentage of our GDP, $30 million a year, 40. You're familiar with the numbers. Mm -hmm. You see that they, they were very modest. So it was manageable, but we were still never getting to the point of balance. So we were very conservative. And then what happened, I think, to really accelerate the fiscal situation or deteriorate the fiscal situation was the 2008 global meltdown. That was no fault of any particular one government. And I think the, the, in the 10 years hence, governments, I mean in plural, both administrations, would have had to spend at a higher clip in relation to revenues than they would have. Because the truth of the matter is that when your economy is um, not performing well, it is good fiscal policy by both administrations to fill that gap with extra spending. All right. So what that, but what that, the net impact of that has meant that in the last 10 years, our national debt has doubled in both, as a, uh, not as a percentage of our GDP, but certainly in nominal terms, and it has certainly gone up precipitously as a percentage of our GDP. So to answer your question, yeah, for the most part of our history, we had been very, very fiscal conservative and running small deficits. But the last 10 years has really put us into that cash crunch area where we were getting close to a dangerous precipice. Mm -hmm. Additionally, and this was one of the features that came out in this particular budget exercise for me, we had a substantial uh, volume of undeclared liabilities. And that's the $360 million that, until it was put into this budget, Bahamian citizens at large didn't know that they existed. And, and so even though, so that wouldn't have been factored in into all of those deficits. And the policy decision of the government was to ensure that all liabilities are actually, all known liabilities are presented and accounted for. And that's, that's almost $400 million. So, so, so it was, those are the combination of factors. We've had a significant ramp up in known debt, and we had this massive number out there that wasn't known to the Bahamian public. And the, 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 the debt that was unknown is local debt? For the lion's share, most of it is locally. That's been the advantage that we have. But most of it, the lion's share of it is, is owed to ourselves, is owed to public entities and the like. But we still owe quite a considerable sum of money to, to international people. The cruise agencies, for example, own a significant um, um, portion of that. And, and worse than that, at least for me from a Ministry of Finance standpoint, we hadn't been making allocations to address it. And at some point, those would have come to, to beat us in the head. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Johnson. Sorry. We've always had an economy mm -hmm. that has been vulnerable very much so. to external shocks. Yes. All right? Because essentially, I call our economy a residual economy. Right. And it's residual because it, it depends on, first of all, the state of the, our neighbor, nearest neighbor, the US, right. the state of the economy. Right. And then when you look at our second sector, financial services, right. it, it also is depending on Europe. And, and America, right? So, right. We've, so we've always been vulnerable. Right. And, and the economic disruptions that we've had in our country right. has been external. Very true. Right? It hasn't been due to poor management right. of, our, of our fiscal affairs. Right. It's been uh, external induced. Right. All right? Right. And as a result of that, mm. as Joan said, we have been fiscally responsible. Right. But it is just that, for example, right. from 1999 mm -hmm. to 2017, right. we've had four category five hurricanes. Right. Right. And you know, from a financial aspect, right. that is a very uh, uh, serious. Yeah, absolutely. Right? absolutely right. And I, I, my view is that it is some of these things right. which has exacerbated our deficit. Right. All of those things that you said are absolutely true. But I, that logic is what, to my mind, would drive us to necessarily be a little bit more fiscally conservative. Because we are vulnerable to external shocks, both man-made and, and natural, it behooves us to take a very, very conservative approach and to ensure that we try to manage that vulnerability. To, you know, Mr. Jones made the point about the fact that we have substantial reserves. Part of that was driven by the $750 million in, in borrowing that we did last year that boosted our reserves. But even outside of that, the reserves were healthy because the economy was starting to expand. And so we're in a good place. But what small vulnerable economies like ours have to do is to even go way past that particular threshold. You know, 12 weeks is the mark. We are 22 weeks now. And we want to stay in that range um, precisely because of the external vulnerability. But I understand that, that, that our, our reserves are 1.4 or 1.5 billion? Yeah, yeah, but 22 weeks cover. So yeah, they're doing 1. well. 1.5 so, billion. So yeah, they're, they're, they're doing well. But I'm saying a lot of that was driven because we, we got a, we got a, we got a top up. Yeah. Um, with, the, with the international born. And again, that's nothing abnormal. But the point I'm making is that when your reserves are strong and you have a vulnerable economy because 
even with our Category 5s, we've been very fortunate that we've had not had a catastrophic hit on your Providence. Yeah. Because that would have been the game set of much. So that's, you know, in relative terms, we've still um, been able to weather that. But that's always a possibility. That's a possibility every year. And the challenge for us fiscally was because, again, that 10-year uh, window of, 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 of sluggish economy has meant that we really have had to dive deep into our borrowings. And, mm. um, and, and that has sort of constrained our head a bit. You know, before um, Hurricane Matthew mm -hmm. uh, last year, the deficit mm. <coughs> reduced to 120 odd million dollars? Well, okay. So, yes? No. Um, before, actually, before Matthew hit, the, the deficit was budgeted at 100 million dollars. Right. The deficit ended up at 661 million dollars, right? The, of that, the borrowings for Matthew was about $150 million, okay. okay? And you would have probably had maybe a $100 million disruption in the economy, meaning that, you know, because of the fall off in, 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 in tourism activity. So if you, if you say Hurricane Matthew, let's say it's responsible for $250 million of the, of the um, fall off, you still got $350 million that was overshot. Yeah, but it, it was going in the right direction. Oh, yes. That's the point. The value added tax had... Uh, the, Positive impact. the the deficit going in the right direction. Yes? No. See, again, I wouldn't agree with when that. When it was introduced. No, when it was introduced, it, the, the, its first year, one of the features of the VAD was that the VAD created this sort of cash windfall mm -hmm. um, for the administration. And again, what, what are the features, though, that even taken aside from the hurricane, the deficit targets that it had set wasn't being met. The deficit targets were consistently being overshot. And that will happen on the occasional year. You, it'll be impossible to fault any administration for missing a target. And again, when you have a hurricane, the kind of match which had the impact, it would not be reasonable to expect them to meet their budgetary targets. The challenge, though, was even correcting all of that because we introduced VAT and we consistently, even accounting for those um, anomalies, we were consistently missing our, our deficit targets. It means that year on year that instead of trending in the direction we wanted it to go, the, it, was, it was ballooning, it didn't stabilize. And that was the intent of the, but as articulated by the former administration, was to get to a point of stabilization. Yeah. Mr. Johnson, I, I've been doing some reading, and I, I found that there's not one country mm -hmm. in this hemisphere right. with a balanced budget. Right. Mm -hmm. Not one. Mm -hmm. So why would the government of the Bahamas uh, seek to balance the budget in right. such a short period of time. Right. Uh, because the complaint is right. that what you're doing right. is just putting a, a burden right. on the business community, right. the private sector, right. and on the average Bahamian citizen. Right. So, so why seek to balance the budget in three short years? Right. Uh, we would probably be the only country right. in this hemisphere right. with a balanced budget. Right. Well, again, th that's a policy decision. But I think what would inform that decision would be sort of the recognition that for years we had been in a point of deterioration. Go back to again the last 10 years. Is that we, we had gotten the point fiscally when we look at, at where we are without the tax increase where our deficit would have been close to $700 million without the tax increase, given all of the arrears and everything that the government found its known, known sort of commitments. The reality is that it needed to be tackled in a short space of time because we, in our estimation, were running out of the boring headroom. And the challenge that the government would have faced is that every year we delay it, we would be having to devote considerably more resources to paying off interest. And that is the sort of the interest trap that countries get into that leads to decline. Yeah, sorry, so given the vulnerabilities mm. that, um, that, that Godfrey would have mentioned, and given the fact that we really are a one-crop economy, meaning that we are heavily reliant on tourism, the government took the policy decision, and again, it's debatable, uh, that it would be in the country's best interest to stabilize us and get ourselves on a positive track. One of the points that you read the IMF report, it, it said, and it's, uh, that, that, that resonated, I think, with me certainly, was the fact that we needed to get to the point where we're now starting to put aside a, um, money for hurricane preparedness in the sense that uh, we, it would be ideal if we get to the point where we start to run small surpluses so we can start to add to the inevitable hurricane that will hit us. Yeah, but the IMF can say anything right. that they want. We right. are developing a country. Right, right. As we said earlier on, it is, was developing very nicely. And um, the 300 and odd million dollars that you added to 
the deficit. You, you, you aren't paying interest on that. You're not paying interest to the uh, average business that the government owes some money but, to, but the contractor of, here. Yeah, but and that's there. part of the problem. So, so why would you the, consider, uh, why would you talk about the interest on, on $300 million right, when but, it's owed essentially to local vendors? No, no, no. I wasn't talking about interest to that. But certainly, well, two things on that. Our debt, our interest mm. our payment, this fiscal, new fiscal year, went up by $90 million mm. to $381 million. The challenge when you run massive structural deficits, if we don't reverse that, next year, now you're talking about a bigger number. And every dollar that we have to spend on interest is dollar, the money that we don't, we have. On top of that, we have a massive capital infrastructure deficit, meaning that it's just that we've been delaying the repair of roads. We have schools that are end of life. We have about six or seven schools that are past their useful life. We have any number of docks that we need to repair, airports we need to regenerate. So we have a massive capital deficit. That really is a cost that goes uh, unbudgeted. So yes, we have been doing OK, but we were not in a position where, to my view at least, um, we actually have the infrastructure to match our 21st century, uh, 21st century 2018 standard. But the challenge when you owe these small vendors is as a small businessman, well now you're probably a medium sized to large businessman now, but you know what it's like to be a small businessman. The cramp that it puts on a small business when a government has an unfunded liability to them is substantial. The, f the, the cramp that it puts on BPL when the government owes them $25 million is substantial because it's a cash flow constraint and they have to find the money to buy the oil and the, we the consumers now have to cover that. The money that's owed to NIB has a real, real impact. So at some point, those chickens come home to roost and you have to actually start to pay them down. You can get away a little bit with the public corporations because they are yours, but certainly the damage that has been done to small vendors, I'm sure you're aware of this, is substantial when governments don't pay their bills on time. Mm -hmm. We can't, we, 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 not, we should not be born from them in that way. Yes, yes, okay. <laughs> we have to take a break here. Uh, this is our program, Jones and Company, and uh, we have as our special guest, the Financial Secretary of the Bahamas, Mr. Marlon Johnson. We'll come right back. <laughs> 